Matthew 16, 18, this shall be the, 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 the first uh, scripture that I share with us. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. God said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I remember when I was a young Christian, I hear this word. In my mind, I always think about Satan attacking the church, and the church is just enduring, you know, just doing our best to make sure that all the gates of hell will not break loose, and then we are just all trying our very best to stop the gates of hell from bursting. That's the picture I have. And that's a picture that just painted to me. You know what I mean? It's like, wow, you know, Satan is everywhere. He's so powerful, and Christians are barely making it. Then as I grow older, I realize, hey, actually, the reverse is true. You know, it's like we are authoritatively telling that you will not prevail over us, that the gates of hell will not prevail over us. And you know, how many of you all have read certain menu, or not menu, how do you call it? Menu, right? Menu, it's not menu, right? Menu. How many of you have read, so let's say for iPhone, right? Sometimes you first read, you see certain function and capacity and capability of the phone, but as you read further, you discover more function. Does it happen to you? Or you discover that there's more things that we can do, or there are more things you can understand. Does it happen to you? Yeah? Actually, it's the same with the Bible. It's progressive revelation. What, what, what the Lord spoke to me this week about this particular verse, it blew my mind. We have been thinking about the gates of hell, you know, about coming to the church externally and the body of Christ, you know, it's all outside. I want to shift your mind today. Taking off on this verse, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, and then 6, 19. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 says that, Don't you know that you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Yeah, you are the temple of God. You are the church. The Holy Spirit lives in you. And then in 6, 19, maybe we can... Yeah. 6, 19, it says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Later we take the offering away. The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, whom you have from God, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Listen to this, guys. We are all bought at a price. And the price is the blood of Jesus. That your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That God lives in you. Now, so the gates of hell do not prevail against the church. It's not the church. Not just as a body of Christ, but you are the church. That is, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. You are the gates of heaven. So the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. I will build my church. That is, God will build you, and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Amen? The gates of hell will not prevail against us. We are thinking about the church as a building. We are thinking about the church out there. But actually, this church, that the gates of hell will not prevail, is not against just the collective church. But the individual church. That means God will build you. You are the individually, you are the church of God because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, every one of us, and that makes us a vessel, that makes us a temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul said twice, 3 16, 6 19, don't you know that your body is the temple of God? That means this is the vessel. The house of the Holy Spirit. Said, Don't you know that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Actually, on this verse alone, if you really dwell upon the truth of this verse, it will blow your mind. That means the church was never a building. We have over the years has reduced the church into a physical location. We have over the years reduced church to a building. So our concept is that unless I go to that place, we cannot have service. So I'm more aware of the physical location than I'm aware of the spiritual location where the Holy Spirit actually is dwelling in me. We are the actual church. Collectively, we are called the body of Christ. Individually, we are still the temple of the Holy Spirit. That is, this, the, there are two concepts to a church. One is a collective church, which is called the body of Christ. And then individually, we are also the house of God. Individually, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. So when Jesus said that I will build my church, means he will build you, and then the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Amen? Because the human body, our vessel, can either be a gate for darkness to go through, or we can be a gate 
for the power of the Holy Spirit for heaven to flow through. How many know that? The power of darkness actually can use our body, our this vessel for for a purpose for his for his kingdom objective. Let's take a look at um, Romans chapter eight, verse eight to nine. He says, "So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If you indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his." He says that the flesh cannot please God. There are a few things that we can't please God. If we don't have faith, we can't please God. He said. It's impossible to please God without faith. Without faith, in fact, it's impossible to please God. That's one. Two, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That means the, the, you see, most of us think we please God by what? By just going for ministry, doing service, you know, we do things to please God. But actually, those are the expression of us wanting to please God. The real way, the actual way when God sees us, whether we are pleasing towards Him, it depends whether they are walking in the Spirit or walking in the flesh. That means after we are born again, guys, after we are born again, do you know that the flesh still exists? How many knows? This is a mystery that has plagued, baffled a lot of Christians because we are thinking, I have the Holy Spirit, I'm born again, I speak in tongues, I do this, I do that. How come, you know, I still have all this different temptation? You know, and and and, and we, we, we sometimes cannot understand that because Wow, this we have to go back. In the Garden of Eden, actually the flesh never existed before they took the, the tree of the knowledge and glory to God. The dimension of the flesh did not exist. That means Adam and Eve did not have this dimension of the flesh. The flesh is not this physical body. It's the sinful nature that's in us. That's the flesh. The flesh is not the physical body, but it's the sinful nature that's in us. That means before Adam and Eve took the tree of the knowledge and glory to God, they didn't have that dimension in them. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 3. The one I gave you is, uh, yeah, thank you. It said, but of the tree, Eve was telling the serpent, but of the tree, of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat it, nor you shall touch it, lest you die. This part, Eve added, nor shall you touch it. God didn't say that. But because she didn't hear it firsthand, she heard it from Adam. So she added on, he said, thou shalt not touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Or in Singapore language, she said, I uh, won't die one, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah. So you won't die one. Uh, for God, okay. this is Singapore English. Right? <laughs> said, for God knows that on the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. So there is one light that he told, and then there's a truth that he told. You notice Satan will not tell outright lies, and then that we just tell the truth without lies. Because he said, he will not surely die. That's not true. I say that, but your eyes will be open. That's true. But how do we know that you can see the truth? But what you meant and what the other party here is different. Oh, yes, absolutely. When Satan said, Your eyes shall be open, they thought that they are open to another dimension that will bless them. But they do not know that their eyes will be open to a dimension that will plague them, that will start from them as a source of an uh, uh, element of their body that never existed in the garden even originally. That means they will inherit this dimension called the flesh. The law of sin and death keeps them. So actually, when Adam and Eve partake of the tree, one of the key things that will happen is that this nature will pass down from Adam and Eve. That means they become the progenitor of the law of sin and death. That is through them, the partaking of the fruits that flesh nature come into every one of us. That's why in John 3, 3, it says that, that which is born, 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 that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Uh, no, John 3, 3. Did I give John 3, 3? No, huh? Okay, never mind. You can just quickly just add it. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the... That means God make the distinction that those who are born of the flesh, which every one of us inherit them, where we are born physically, we are born of the flesh. That's why everyone is born, not three, six, sorry. Everyone is born with that nature. Every one of us, we are born with that flesh nature because it started in the Garden of Eden. And that's why God has caused us to another dimension to be born in the spirit to restore us back to the nature 
the original function in the garden of Eden. But after being born again, your flesh is still there. That's why Paul said, that I will to do, I do not do. That which I will not to do, that I do. That's why you find that consistently, you find that the, the, the flesh and the spirit, the lust against one. And Romans 8, uh, 4 to 6, did I give that to you? Uh, yeah. Is it that the righteous require of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, set their mind on the things of the flesh. That those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit, for to be carnal minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Wow, that means what God is saying that both of us, in within us, there is this choice within us to live either in the flesh or to live in the spirit. This exists. That means after you are born again, we do not automatically get rid of this fleshly nature. Rather, God added the dimension of the spirit within us to counter the nature of the flesh that's in us. And that is why you find that there's constantly this battle between the flesh and the spirit. So if you are not feeding the word of God, your spirit will be weak. Can I say that one more time? Even though it's a very familiar statement. If you are not feeding yourself with the word of God, your spirit will be weak. If your spirit is weak, then it is no wonder your life is constantly in the battle and you are constantly being defeated by the enemy. Not because Jesus is not powerful, but because he has given us it is predisposed to us the tools for us to feed our spirit, to strengthen us. But it's still decision is predicated on us. That means I have to exercise my will to feed myself in the spirit. And this is where we 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 stumble. This is this is where we think that by praying, oh God help me, strengthen me. We you see, a lot of things cannot be done by prayer. How many know that? Prayer is important, but you will not grow simply by prayer. Because you don't feed yourself with the word of God. Pray alone will not work. You can pray until the cow come home. You can pray for 24, 24, 7. Just pray alone will not going to build this spiritual house. Man shall not live what? By prayer alone. No, by the bread, word of God. Not by bread alone, but by the word of God. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That means, if you are only relying on prayer to grow yourself, you'll be disappointed. In fact, you'll be, you'll be baffled. You'll be done for. How come? I've been praying for so hard. I've been, I've been praying. How come I'm not growing? Because growth don't come by prayer. Growth come by us feeding the Spirit. That means in this, in this chapter, Paul actually is highlighting for us, within us actually, we are either the gates of heaven or we are become the gates of hell. The flesh is actually the very portal where Satan expresses himself. Everything, that's why God said, anything that's on the flesh cannot please God. Why? Because to be carnally minded, which is in the thing from the flesh, in fact, is death. But he said, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That means this is still a choice that every believer needs to exercise. This is a, a position that we must be aware so that we are not ignorant thinking by just, you know, doing religious activity by just partaking in some church activity I'm growing. The actual growth comes when the seed falls on the good soil. If there's no seed which is the word of God and if your soil is not soft, it's not good, then nothing goes. The Bible says the soil can produce a hundred, a sixty and a thirty. It's predicated on the soil and the seed. In, in short, you, that's why if you think about Jesus' message, he's always talking a lot to agriculture. Oh, a farmer does this, a farmer does that. Why? Because everything begins with the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, right? In the beginning was the Word. And without the Word, nothing's happened. That means nothing happens without the Word of God. Even in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, and the earth was without form, it was chaos and darkness rose covers the earth, and Holy Spirit covers above the water. That is, the Holy Spirit did not go into action until God spoke the word, like be. So even God has to speak the word for something to happen. That is, the Holy Spirit was hovering above the water, waiting for the command. Today, the Holy Spirit is waiting for you because we hardly declare the word of God. The Holy Spirit is waiting for believers to declare things into being. 
When you pray for somebody, when you speak life to somebody, you are shifting, you are shaping people's life. When you decree words of life into somebody, you are depositing something in them. You are the gates of heaven. Listen to this, guys. When you speak words of life, don't worry about the camera. Listen to the message, Sarah. Don't worry, the camera is recording myself. When you listen, when you listen, I see a couple of messages. When you speak words of life, you become the portal of heaven. But when you say curse words, when you say bad words, when you say evil words, when you speak words that are that that that, that carries death, you become the portal of hell, literally. So Jesus said that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. There are dimensions to the understanding. And one of the dimensions is you being the vessel of the Holy Spirit. God will not want you to become the portal of the power of darkness. When we speak words that are that are bad, when we speak words that are that carries you know a lot of bad meaning. When we speak words that, that bring curses, sometimes we curse people, sometimes we speak bad words to people, sometimes in our anger we say nasty things to people. At that moment, you become a portal of darkness, right? Yes, we do not know that. You will be surprised how often the power of darkness are using us. It is more often than the power of darkness moved through our tongue. That's why the James chapter 2, I think it's verse 2 or 3, they say that the man who holds his tongue is a perfect man. James chapter 2, I think verse 2 or 3. Oh, did I get it wrong? Oh no, ah, sorry. I think it's James 3. James 3. Yeah, James 3. For if we all stumble in many things, but if anyone does not stumble in the word, he's a perfect man. Wow. If anyone who do not stumble in word is a perfect man, that means your words are either always through your mouth, your mouth, our mouth is either being used by the power of darkness or used by the Spirit of God. How many know that? If you don't know that, please do. Because, you see, you do not know when, you see, most of us think that Satan is out there. We think that Satan is always using somebody out there, somebody else. But you'll be quite surprised that the power of darkness, you, that we are being used by the power of darkness more often than we think. That's why the Lord says, when you please the flesh, it can't please it. Those who walk in the flesh cannot please the spirit. Because the spirit and the flesh, they last against one another. The whole idea, listen to this guys, the whole idea of the garden, the episode that happened in the garden, you don't stop about eating your forbidden fruit. It is Satan imparting his nature into human. It's a, it's a grand scheme, it's a big thing. From the day onwards, when their eyes were open, they become aware of another dimension called the carnal nature that Adam and Eve did not have when they were originally created. So that partaking of the fruits is actually the enemy's strategy. Because when God says that go forth and multiply and rule the earth, immediately Satan raced to make sure that he reached the objective. To make sure that he is together in men competing with God. Am I getting clear? That is Satan's job actually in the true the choice of the three. You, when Adam is chose the wrong tree, it is very, very pivotal. It is it's like this whole event is, what's the word for it? It's literally earth shaking because it's a decision that they take that changed the course of human history. So much that even the Son of God has to come personally, shed his own blood to correct that direction, to correct the error. Think about it. This error is so big that God Himself cannot even forgive men without blood being shed. And this is not just ordinary blood of animal, it has to be the perfect blood of the Son of God, the sinless Lamb, the sinless Son of God that carries none of the DNA of the fallen nature. So that's why the virgin birth has to be planned. That is why God has to be born, and Jesus has to be conceived in the Holy Spirit. And through a virgin birth, it is an elaborate plan that's conceived by God since before even 
you know, the earth was formed. If you go back and actually meditate on James 3, 2, he said, we all stumble in many things. But if anyone does not stumble in words, then it's God saying that you can stumble in many things. But if you don't stumble in words, and say, in fact, you're perfect. This tells us that words are very important. Because why? I realized that as I watch movies, sometimes in Chinese language, sometimes in Indonesian language, sometimes in languages that I don't understand what they're subtitled by, I realized that every nation, people, tongues, and tribe convey what they mean and find meaning in words. Without words, there's nothing you can convey. I look at some video, a three-year-old girl talking like an adult. Wow, that mind, that three-year-old mind is able to conceive certain concepts and words that can convey what they feel inside. Your words are very powerful. And that is why one of the things that Satan imparted to us is the carnal nature. So that we can constantly be used as a vessel to speak death. Colossians uh, chapter 2, I think it's verse, if you can put 2 and 3 together. Colossians, and also sorry, uh, Ephesians, not Colossians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. Is that among whom we are also once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. That means before you're born again, you conduct yourself in the lust of the flesh. But for some of us, after you're saved, you're still doing the same thing. That in which you once were according, thank you for being happy, number two. That in which you once were according to the course of this world. That means there is a spiritual cause that Satan directed, like just that you do not know, because it's an invisible cause. Every one of us are actually put in the cause. It's according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit who now should work in the sons of disobedience. The prince of the power of the air is a very powerful entity that operates up in the air that influences the mind of the nations, of territory. That is why you find you go to some particular nation that is a very strong trait among these people. Or you go to a particular community, there are some habits that this community is being, uh, that they have inculcated over the years, and a certain mindset that you find is very difficult to break through. Because these are ruled by the prince of the power of the air. Their job actually is to, is to actually capture a nation through their thoughts. Can we have 2 Corinthians 4 4? I hope today you're not overdosed. In 2 Corinthians 4 4, he said that, that whose mind the God of this world has blinded. That one of the role of the God of this world is to blind the minds of the unbeliever. That is, before you come to know Jesus, every one of us, our mind will actually is in full control of the devil, the, the prince of the power of the air. Everyone, without exception. Every one of us, in fact, there are still many believers after they get saved, that state of reality remains the same. Why? Because we are barely actually transformed by the word of God. That's why the Bible says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Or some versions say, do not conform to the system of this world. Why? Because the system of this world is designed by this entity called the Prince of the Power of the Earth. What is the purpose? The objective of this purpose is to make sure that you are being led by the flesh all the time. That means, what does that mean to being led by the flesh? That means Satan wants to establish you as his expression, portal of his expression. So when you speak vulgar language, when you speak curse word, when you speak nasty words, you are actually the mouthpiece of Satan. Yes, I met many believers there's no qualms using the F language the way they use so the proliferation of F language is amazing. You know, and, and, and they have no qualms about speaking that way. Because you don't understand that you are used by the enemy. Because no, you see, in fact, in James 3, you see that from the same, from the same well, you cannot flow fresh, uh, fresh water. <laughs> the fresh and the flesh is getting me confused. From the same well, it doesn't flow fresh water and salt water. Cannot. But we are doing this. That means our mouth, uh, same thing, speaking blessing, and the same in the church. Hallelujah. Outside the church, you know, you, 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 there, is, there are languages that you use that sometimes I'm amazed. 
Even as a pastor, they speak in front of me, you know, and they're so proud. Oh, pastor, that's the way I am. I, I don't hide myself from you. I mean, okay, I'm glad you don't hide yourself from me. But, you know, but, but you do not know that you're being used as a vessel. You, you are being used at that very moment. You're casting out spirit and all those that are important. But you know what? This kind of spirit remains in you. Full deliverance is when your tongue is being fully converted. Full deliverance is when you receive knowledge like what we are doing today that let you know that you can still remain a gate, a portal of, of darkness after your born. Because why? Paul said that. You know, don't, don't think you are born again. No. I, when I was young, I thought after you are born again, you become a Christian, you go to church. After a few years, you become a very good Christian, right? You become, you know, you become a nice Christian, you become a good Christian. All these are wrong things. This is all fantasy. These are things, the tradition that has taught us. I think it's time for us to let go of certain tradition and come back to reality. You know, we, we, we are against, you know, we sometimes speak against, um, Thanks for this verse, for me. They say no spring use both salt water and fresh water. It's true. But 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 guess what? But it's happening for some people. So don't you ever do that. Don't think it is okay to just sprout vulgarities and profanity. No, you, you are being used as a vessel. Your tongue is being used by the enemy. Oh yes, that's why the Bible says isn't it right? Death and life lies in the power of the tongue. Right? Who 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 was the purveyor of death? Satan. Who who carries life? God. So every time you speak death, your mouthpiece, the gates of hell has prevailed you. Every time when you let your mouth to, to sprout profanity, when your when your words come in hurting, when your words are hurting people, when your words are cutting people down, when your words are wounding people, you have become the portal of darkness. Yes. I wish it was not true. We, we become, you see, so we become a portal of darkness without even knowing. That's the best part. That means you are only aware of a certain activity that Satan, or counting or that satanic, uh, count or that satanic, you know, certain uh, therical, you know, that satanic. Oh, but there, there are more things that Satan has invaded our life than you think. In fact, let me say this. At the risk of being misunderstood, before you are born again, you are completely owned by Satan. We are completely owned, just that we do not know. Before you are born again, the Bible says that which born of the flesh is flesh. Completely. That means before you are born again, you are only born in the flesh. That means you are under his territory. Uh, that, that, that now, uh, in fact, that is why it's so important to share the gospel of salvation. Because why? It is only when the person receives the gospel of salvation, it is the power of God that can deliver us from the power of darkness. Oh, you have no idea. You have no idea that, that sharing the gospel is not just about, oh, winning souls so that our church can grow, uh, winning souls so that, you know, we bring more people to church, more people become Christian. No, these are all human thinking. When you speak, when you, when you share the gospel, you are actually setting people free from the change of darkness. When you share the gospel, you're opening up their eyes so that they can, you are, we are literally in a rescue job. What is that word that we use? Those people who rescue people from hostages. Uh, what would you call this? Anyway, special forces, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's no different from you going to Afghanistan. Rescue three prisoners, let's say today, three Singaporeans. You know me. Uh, 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 after I learned English, by the other right? When you have got people who are held in prison, right? Only the rest, the special force can do the rescue. You and me can't do it. That means when you can share the gospel with somebody, you need to have the special force skill because you are going to enemy territories and break the change of darkness and bring them out into the marvelous land. That's why sharing the gospel is not easy. That's why many of you all try to share the gospel with friends, but you do not know how. Why? Because you are not trained in the word of God. Because you don't understand how the enemy has already built the foundation of thoughts, true thoughts, imprisoned. Uh, many people are actually imprisoned by their thoughts. That's it. It's your thoughts. People who reject the gospel is because their thoughts, their mind has been programmed to reject the gospel. Hey, there's no God. 
You know, when I went to Moscow in 1996, I went to a particular university, you know, they're so proud, they have a picture there. The Sputnik, they went up to, uh, the Sputnik is the first uh, astro uh, astronauts that went to the moon. And they showed a picture of an astronaut in, in the space. And they said, where is God? No God. That means they went up to heaven and they find no God there. It's a mockery. It's a taunt to God in this uh, atheistic society that we were in heaven. The dear book, where is God? You see, because we are programmed, the Satan has. Guys, you, you have no idea. The reason why you have problems sharing the gospel is because you don't understand. The, in fact, you don't understand. The, you need to see the picture behind the picture. To share the gospel with someone, when somebody receives Jesus, you are breaking stronghold of darkness through light. But if your light is most of the time only one bar, you, yours is amber light. You know, you know sometimes you turn out the torch and there's not enough battery, you know, the kind of light it gives you. Hardly even have, right? I mean, now these people don't use torch light all the time. When we were young, we were highly dependent on torch light because, you know, my house, after 12 o'clock, there's no more power. So the power supply will cut off at 11.30 because it comes from a private operator. So our house after 11.30 is all well done. So we are highly dependent on torch light. And then there are sometimes that torch light because of the battery, you know, never change. And then you turn it on, you barely even any light. Actually, most Christians are like that. I was like that before. That means when you turn on the light, there's barely any light. Not enough for you to look for the truth. If you are sitting in the truth, and if your light is weak, that's why when you share the gospel, nobody comes to the light because your light is barely existing. You need to charge yourself. Hey, let's go to John chapter 1. I think it's verse 4. I think it's verse 4. If I remember, if I remember correctly. John chapter 1, verse 4. That in him was the life. And the life was the light of men. You see, your life is dependent on the life that you have. The life you have is dependent on the amount of intake of the word of God that you have. So when Jesus said, I will build my church, that means God said, I will build you so that the gates of hell will not prevail against you. So that every time when you speak, you become a vessel of life. Every time when you stand, light is shining. Not not standing there, but there's no light. That's what the Bible says. The foolish virgin are the one that's got lamb, but there's no oil. When the lamb has got no oil, it gives no light. Unfortunately, this reality plagues the church deeply. Many of, many of us, including myself at one time, are lambs without light. We are just for sure that we are Christian, but we are not shining. Because without oil, we can't shine. In fact, not only you can't shine, even if your eyes are open, but if the atmosphere is in darkness, you, even if your eyes work, if it's in darkness, you can't see. That's why God said to open their eyes, right? Turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan, Acts 26, 18, right? So, so that God has to open our eyes, turn us away from darkness into light, and then from the power of Satan, amen? From the power of Satan to God. These are the three conditions that break us. First, we can't see. Even if we can see, we're in darkness. Even if we can be not in darkness, you're under the power of Satan. So when you come into, when somebody receives Jesus, you have first set them free from the power of Satan to God. But they remain in darkness, their eyes remain closed. That is why a lot of Christians are still living the, the life in darkness. And that's why a lot of Christians struggle. They do not know why. They say, oh, how come I confess my sin? Pastor will say, maybe there's some sin they won't confess. That's why, you know, Satan is over you. Maybe it's some general curses that is upon the family. So you're going to repent. You know, you don't know how many generations you're going to go back. Well, I, when I was young, I made one pastor who told me that, oh, you know, the reason you're facing all this trouble is because you're not confessed all your sin. So right now, the next one, two right now, all oh, the sin you've ever done. Right now, I confess one better. Oh, my goodness. If there's a way to be set free, we all die. Yeah, because some of you already got amnesia at this age. <laughs> and the gift of forgetfulness. Because some of us, the things you all do, you all remember, you all wish you all remember, but you're too shameful to face that. So, you see, these are the stuff that I was taught. So, I remember, I actually sit down with him, write down all my scene for one, two hours. 
And then one time, then I was thinking, but what other sin have I forget to confess? So if any sin I forget to confess, I still under the curse. We are all taught in the worst manner possible. We are all taught wrongly. And so, you know, so every day there's some people who do nothing but confess their sin. You know, you live a miserable life. How can that be the abundant life? That's more like an abandoned life. Not abundant life. So every day you live just to confess your sin. What kind of Christian, what kind of life is this? Wow. You know, and so we're so blind. And these are people who taught us, they teach us. And they teach us to do that. So for six months, I was under heavy oppression. Every day, worry about sins that I never con con confess. The minute something is wrong in my life, oh, it must be some sin I've not confessed. Oh, wait, 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 you in peace. Okay. So the Bible says to open your eyes and turn them from darkness to God. When you and me got saved, God saved us from the power of, the, of Satan to God. But we are remaining in darkness and our eyes are not open. That's why seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear. That's why God said, No eyes have seen, no ear heard, no mind can see what God has prepared. That means what God prepared for you, unless, can we go to that first Corinthians, uh, first Corinthians 2 9 and 10? See, that means unless the Holy Spirit is there to illuminate you, you do not know what God has given to you. And if you do not know what God has given to us, you're still praying for things that God has given to us. Eyes are not seen, nor your head, but enter the hearts of men. The things which God has prepared for those who love Him. But what, what God revealed to us through His Spirit. God revealed to us through His Spirit. Because the Spirit searches all things. The deep things of God. There are deep things of God. Most of us have even been to a shallow pool and talk about the deep things of God. You're pong pong, when you know pong pong. Last time when baby, when they are, you know, when we are baby in the in a in a in a, in a village, rainy day, uh, you cannot just see away bath the baby, you gotta tap the water, put the chest, test the water, put the chest, so he is accustomed to the to the water. You know, that's why you got ah, ah, you know, you got to get him accustomed to the temperature of the water. You know, what's village in the village water is very cold. Yeah, I mean those days, you know, if you are living in the village, if it's a rainy day, you know how we got water, you gotta boil one kettle of water and then pour into the pail. That's how it troublesome it is. I'm sure you'll do the same in Poima, right? So so this, this village life. You know, so so we 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 have God say God has prepared things for us, but he said that but only God revealed them to us through his spirit. In fact, verse 12, same chapter of Pauline, if we go on to verse 12. One of the role of the Holy Spirit is to reveal to us what He has freely given to us. Because if you do not know what God has freely given to you, we remain in ignorance. Now we receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which for our purpose, that we might know the things that be freely given to us by God. You see, I do not know what has been freely given to me. So I spent two hours writing all my sin. Hoping to confess and hoping not to leave anyone out so that I will not be cursed, so that I will not live under the domain of Satan, thinking that's the only way to deliver myself. Because why? I was uninformed. I do not know the things that's been freely given to us by God. That's called the gift of righteousness. So if you don't know that God gave you the gift of righteousness, you're still trying to establish your righteousness by confessing that you sin. What a terrible way I was taught. The blind, the what Santi quoted, the blind leading the blind, Masol Lokan straight away. Masol Lokan chased me straight out the train. Yeah, the blind was leading the blind, and then I was happily led by him. But something told me in my spirit it was not right. I don't know why I was a young Christian, but someone tell me this, that's not the right way. How can, how can God work in this way? But back to the point, we are almost all highly close. The point that we want to say today, guys, is that when the, when the Lord says that I will build my church, that means God will build you. He said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That means God says that the gates of Hades will not prevail against each and every one of us. And what does that mean? That means not only receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, but also walking in the Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit is easy. Yeah, go in front, pay with tongue, say bala 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 bala, right? But walking in the spirit is different. That one you need to be instructed by the Holy Spirit. That one you need to have the seed, the seeded soul 
in order to walk in the spirit. You see, you cannot walk in the spirit if there's no word. So, carry on John 6 63. A lot of people will try to walk in the spirit without the word of God. You'll go mad. That's why you, you because why? Without the word of God, there's no parameter, there's no boundary. Everything is from the Holy Spirit. It's, it's all your breakfast. It says it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. In fact, you'll be quite surprised how much the Bible talks about the flesh. It's useless, it's contradicting to God. It lasts against the spirit. He cannot please God without the flesh. He says it's the spirit that gives life the flesh. That means in our life, this kind of nature that occupies us cannot do anything. It is the spirit that gives life. And the word I've spoken to you, they are spirit and they are life. Amen. That means if you want to walk in the spirit without the word of God, you are bluffing yourself. People who say, oh, I hear from God, God, tell me this, God, tell me that. I used to be very impressed by people like that. But now I know that in error. It is very dangerous to hear from somebody who hear from God who never read the word of God. Can I repeat myself? Like, it's very dangerous to hear from people who say they receive a word from God when they never read the word of God. And it's very irresponsible. You cannot go around telling people to hear from God when you hardly read the word of God. That's, that's, that's crazy. It's very dangerous. Because the word of God provides boundary. Because without the word, you don't have boundary. That means you operate from a spirit. You, Paul said that even if an angel appeared to you, preaching a different gospel. Let the angel be a curse. That is, Paul is saying that in the realm of the spirit, even the angels can come with a counterf counterfeit message if this angel is from the other side. So Paul is so certain of the gospel he preached. I think it's, uh, I think it's Galatians chapter 1, I think verse 8 or verse 6. Verse 6 or verse 8. He said, if an angel appeared to you preaching a different gospel, let him be a curse. Paul is so certain of the, the message that God gave to him. Then he said, even if an angel appeared to you, don't be impressed by all the angels you see. Of course, we thank God if any angels appear to us. I'm still looking for the visit, the visit from my first angel. You know, he said, if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we preach to me, let him be a curse. Yeah, it's a very strong message. That means Paul is putting himself saying that even if a spiritual being appears to you but brings a different gospel, let him be a curse. So I want you to know, guys, today we are either a portal for light or we are a portal for darkness. We are either a portal for life or we are a portal for death. You cannot do both. From the same spring, you cannot fall fresh water and salt water. From the same mouth, you can either choose to bring life or bring death. That is why Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, it says, Choose this day life or death, blessing or curse. You have to choose. Why? Because in us exist two worlds. In case you do not know, these two reality, these two worlds exist within us. That's why even you are loved by God. Jesus said, uh, no, not Jesus. The, the, the Jehovah, Yahweh said, I call heaven and earth to be witness against you that I set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life. When we choose life, means we are using our free will to choose life. That's why this free will God can. You see, God cannot even violate. That means even God has given you His Son Jesus. It's still up to you to choose Him. How oh, the sovereignty of God versus the, the the free will of man. This is a, this is is like it's both end. That means God's sovereignty does not even violate the freedom of our choice. That means even God's sovereignty cannot override the free will given to man. That's why your soul is such a powerful tool. It's heart, the mind, your heart, and your will. These three things, you can be born again, but these three things can remain untouched by the Word of God and by the Spirit. That means my mind can remain unrenewed, my heart can remain fallen, and my will is still my will. Yep, many Christians, after they become Christian, their will is still their will. They do what we want to do. That's what the world say. This is only that one life, YOLO. You only live once. So make sure you travel to India. <laughs> yeah. So this perpetrated by the world, you only live one. If you have it, flaunt it. You know, if, you know this, I, I, Satan is the most powerful marketer. Every every new catchphrase you hear from the world, is it, have you realized that every other year there's something that comes up in the world? Right? Before What was before you know? Your love. <laughs> what was before you know? Uh, for more, yes, for more, yes, right. Wait, 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 wait. Did you ever wonder where does 
all this catch phrase come from? You think it's by accident? Every other year, something new will come up to distract you and to sell this as truth. So today, all people need to do for more. Now, for more, no longer exists. I hardly hear people say about for more anymore. Right now, the latest about going to die is YOLO. Lah. What if anybody has the latest after YOLO? Huh? Fire. Fire. Who is this? Oh, yeah, yeah, we die early, eh? Fire. Yeah. Fire. Hey, you know what? Good. Good. Of all time. That's more I read. Lah. <laughs> <laughs> God has been there for a while. Like, I'm being heaven come out here. Let me go so far. Yeah? But the point is this. You think all these catch phrases that come out is by accident? No. You find that Satan is a master marketer. Every other year, something new catch phrase will come that will help you to live your life. Christian also adopt that. It's a shame. Your law. So, take on the holiday one, but when come to mission, no time, pastor, because already go to all my holiday. <laughs> YOLO! <laughs> yeah! I never heard of all this Yeah. So, the point is this. You are, we are buying to a system every day without you knowing when you choose good, actually you are rejecting life. You see, in the kingdom of darkness, it's good and evil. In the kingdom of God, it's life and death. Can I repeat myself one more time? In the kingdom of darkness is good and evil. So most of us, decisions are made based on good and bad. But in the kingdom of God, it's either you choose life or death. That I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you. That I set before you life and death. When I look at this statement, I say, God, my God, you are the one that created the heaven and the earth. And yet in your sovereignty and your omniscience and omnipotency, you cannot violate the will of man. How powerful is that, the will of man? That means God cannot violate your will. If you choose not to serve God, there's nothing He can do because this is your choice. And by the time you choose not to serve God, you are not only under spiritual attack, He has conquered you already. People talk about spiritual attack. Actually, in most cases, He has already conquered you. There's no more attack. You're His. Just that we do not know. That's why God, it takes God to open our eyes from darkness that you can see. It's very strange. The people who talk about spiritual attack, most of the time they have been conquered already. Just every time. That's why it's so important to see. One of the most important gifts that God gave to us is the gift of seeing. Because the first thing in Acts 26, 18, he says to open your eyes. Implicit in that statement is we got to apply it. That's why I say the God of this world has blinded the mind. It's not that you can't see physically, but you can't see mentally, you can't see spiritually, and you can't see emotionally. The soul is the seat of contentment, contention. Satan fights for your soul because it's through your soul that he operates in us through us. You know, there's a book, there's a face, there's a verse in the, in the book of Acts, in him we live and move and have our being. Same thing that God desires to do in us, Satan does the same. He wants to live and move and have your being at the same time to control you. And unfortunately, there are people who are born again, but yet remain totally under the influence of the end. But they do not know. Okay, this song is going to end so This is a closing song for us. So today I want to remind you as the word says, choose this day, life or death. And the Bible says that when I build my church at the gates of hell will not prevail. It means that Satan should not prevail over us. It means to say that our words should be constant in whatever we speak. The Bible says it is not what you eat that makes you unclean, but what comes out of your mouth that makes us unclean. See, this is our wisdom from heaven. You see, where else men teach you, if you live a good life, if you do good things, if you are kind to anyone, if you protect the environment, you have good life. Good karma. It will come back to you. But God said, no, but God said, you see, but what, what God teaches is different. Choose this day, life or death. And when you speak, when you become a vessel of life, you find everywhere where you go, literally things begin to grow. When you speak life, literally, there's a spiritual garden that you're building. 
you are restoring yourself back to the God of Eden because we are speaking life. But when we are speaking that we are constantly putting ourselves back in the desert. That is why you're constantly struggling with your spiritual work, constantly battling a lot of fights that you can't even figure out why am I constantly going through this. Choose life and death. And death and life is in the power of the tongue. And you choose how you speak up. If you put if you put Deuteronomy 330 and 19 and Proverbs 20, 20, uh, 18, 21. Choose this day life or death, and what's he yet? Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And guess what? Your tongue is the last expression of your mind. That's why when Satan control your mind, you're finished. Most of us go to the church, our mind remains unrenewed because we don't take time to allow the word of God to actually take roots in us. And this is Satan's strategy to make sure that you remain untouched by the Word of God. You have a lot of information about the Bible, but hardly revelation. You know a lot of facts about God, but you hardly know any truth. And so we remain, we have sight, but we remain in darkness. Satan operates in the most subtle way, and our job is not to get paranoid about him, but our job is to have knowledge of his operation. So we know how to counter, and not only how to counter, we can rule over him. Amen? Your job, my job is to teach you how to rule over the power of darkness. Amen? If you agree, say amen. amen. It's a good skill. Trust me, you need to know how to rule over darkness. You need to know how to prepare yourself against the power of darkness so that when he moves, you know his, how he makes his move, and you are already step three before he puts step one. The Holy Spirit gives us the capacity to, the, the Word of God through the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom, the understanding and the knowledge to position ourselves so that we become a vessel of life 24-7. Everywhere you go, you are bringing life. Everywhere you go, you are imparting life. If you don't know why people don't like to hang around with you, it's because you are generating death most of the time. I'm telling you, absolutely. You can wear the best perfume in the world, dress the most nice clothes, but people will stay away from you. Because why? Your mouth is talking that your spirit carry is all destruction in there. But yet a person looks ordinary, dressed modestly, yet he attracts people. People hang around with them. Why? Because they carry life. They are generating life. And that's how believers should be. We are generating. We are generating and releasing and manifesting life and light. May the gates of hell not prevail over you. May not the power of darkness use you as a portal of his manifestation. But may your life <coughs> and your life, your mind and your heart become a portal of manifesting, manifestation for the power of life in your life. Let's stand.